Now, if you've got your Bible, I'm going to read, to begin with tonight, just two verses from Psalm 66. And while you're turning to that, let me just remind you that we've been looking over several weeks, this is our fourth week, looking at prayer under the title, A Journey into the Heart of God. Because really that's what prayer ultimately is. It's knowing God, it's experiencing God, it's fellowship with God, it's intimacy with God. It's not bringing our shopping list to a celestial supermarket. It's something much deeper, much more profound, much more significant than that. And we've talked about various aspects of this, but tonight I want to talk about Praying effectively, or to give it a negative title, Barriers to Prayer. Because again and again, our praying may seem to be ineffective, our prayers seem to just hit the ceiling and drop dead on the floor, there's little to show for them, and we get discouraged, and so we don't pray. And I'm going to read Psalm 66, verse 19 and 20. And then we're going to look at the passages, verses, and different parts of Scripture tonight. We're going to run around the Bible a little bit to address this theme. And verse 19 comes in the middle of a sentence, and we're going to look at the earlier part of that sentence later. But the middle of the sentence says, But God has surely listened and heard my voice in prayer. This is a confident statement David makes. God has listened and heard my voice in prayer. Praise be to God who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. As I'm going to point out in a few moments, sometimes God does reject our prayer. The scripture tells us that. It warns us of that, that there are conditions which you must meet if our praying is going to be effective. We need to be careful, of course, of reducing prayer to simply some slick technique or some means of maybe feeling we might manipulate God, or worse still, we can gang up on God, and because we all tell him something, he's going to have to do something about that. Real prayer comes out of a relationship with God, as we've described already earlier. I'm told this is a true story, that a three-year-old boy went to the grocery store with his mother. And before they entered the store, his mother said to him, now you're not going to get any chocolate chip cookies today, so don't even ask. Well, she put him in the cart and began to pick up all the different groceries she was there to get, and this little boy was sitting uh, quietly, but eventually he stood up and he said, uh, in the cart, and he said, Mum, can I have some chocolate chip cookies? She said, I told you, don't even ask. You're not going to get any today. But he went quiet again, went down another aisle or so, and the boy again stood up in his little chair and said, Mum, can I please have some chocolate chip cookies? She said, I told you, sit down and be quiet. No, you can't. And as they were approaching the checkout line, the boy thought that this might be his last opportunity. So he stood up in his little chair again, and he said in a loud voice, In the name of Jesus, give me some chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> I'm told this is a true story. And uh, people gathered around, were amused, and the story is that his mother left the store with 23 boxes of chocolate chip cookies, <laughs> everybody else had bought for the little boy. <laughs> well, I think sometimes we're a little tempted like that, that if we really want to pray, there's some kind of magic formula maybe, or some phrase that we can just bring in and put that gives it its authority. But I want to talk about four reasons why God declares in his word he will not answer our prayers. Now, these may seem negative, so the positive side is, when we understand these barriers, how we can pray effectively by dealing with these. And I'm going to read you four verses from four different parts of the scripture. First of all, in the book of James, 
and chapter 4 and verse 3. He says, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Now in the latter part of verse 2 he says you do not have because you do not ask God. Of course that's an obvious reason why we don't get if we don't ask. But when you ask you don't receive. Because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. In other words, I want to suggest to you, your attitude to self might be wrong when you come to God in prayer because your praying is primarily selfish. My motivation is to get what I want, what I need. My praying is all about my needs, it's all about my pleasures, it's all about my agenda. And so my praying by and large is, God, please give me this and give me that and please meet my needs and please look after me because I want this and I want that and I need that and please bless my plans and bless my family and keep me safe and bless me and make sure everything about me is okay. Amen. P.S. Give me more. <laughs> If that's the kind of attitude with which we pray, if our only motivation for prayer is, I've got a problem, therefore I need to talk to God about my problem, and that's the only motivation for prayer. James says, you will ask, but you won't receive. Let me give you a story of uh, somebody who experienced this. His name was Elijah. You remember Elijah, one of the first of the itinerant prophets in the Old Testament scriptures and probably the most famous story about Elijah was the day when he met with King Ahab who was the king of Israel, the northern kingdom where Elijah was living and he said, you traveler of Israel, what are you doing here? And Elijah put a challenge to King Ahab and to the prophets of Baal. You remember they turned away from God and were worshipping these uh, prophets of Baal, these Asherah poles and so on. And the challenge, you read this in 1 Kings 18, was you bring 450 prophets of Baal and they and I will have a contest on Mount Carmel. We'll build two altars. We'll get two bulls. You can choose which altar you want. You can choose which bull you want. And then we'll lay the altar. We'll place the bull on the altar. And you can go first. You ask your God, the Baals, to ignite your sacrifice, your altar. And if he does, he's God. And then I'm going to ask my God to ignite my altar. And if he does, He's God. He says, don't waver between two opinions over this. If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. And the prophets of Baal said, we'll do that. And they built their altar, they selected their bull, and then they began to stand around the altar and call on their God, it says, to ignite their fire. It says they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Oh, Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, it says, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is God? Perhaps he's deep in thought. Maybe he's busy. Maybe he's traveling. Perhaps he's sleeping and mustn't be awakened. The Living Bible adds there, maybe he's in the bathroom. <laughs> that's a liberty they take. It's not in my Bible, but that's Living Bible's there. So they shouted louder and they slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. Midday passed and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response, no one answered, no one paid attention. This is the prophets of Baal calling out to Baal. Nothing happens. Well, we know that side of the story. And then Elijah says, all right, let me call on the God of Israel. But first I'm going to make it very difficult for the God of Israel. He says, fill four large jars of water, pour it on the offering and on the wood, and then do it again. Make sure you douse the wood with water so, humanly speaking, it's not going to ignite. Then do it a third time, he ordered. 
And the water ran around the altar and filled the trench, it says. And at the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and he prayed. And let me show you what he prayed. He prayed twice. Here's his first prayer. O oh Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Nothing happened. So I read on. He says, answer me, O Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you're turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and licked up the water in the trench. But you notice the difference in Elijah's prayers? First prayer, he says, let them know that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Let them know that I am your servant. I have done all this in your command. Let them really know who I am. No answer. His second prayer, oh Lord, he says, let these people know that you are God. And that you're turning their hearts back again. In his second prayer, nothing about let them know that I'm your servant. Let them know that I was right all along. Because you see, when Elijah came, first of all, he was confident in God, as every Christian has every right to be confident in God, but he wanted a bit of the glory. I want them to know that I am your servant. Put me on the map. Get my reputation fully established through this event. God remained silent. No response. No one answered. So answer me, answer me. This time we'll leave my reputation out of the picture. Let you know that you are God. I point this out to you because if James says you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. What are our motives in praying? Our motives are that the purposes of God, the glory of God is seen and known. It's a great privilege that we might become in some way the means by which God reveals his glory. That's true. But the glory doesn't come to us and sometimes we'd like it to be. And sometimes our praying can so easily mingle with selfish, a selfish agenda. So that's the first reason why our praying might be ineffective. Our attitude to self might be wrong. And we have to correct that. We have to come in humility and repentance and say, Lord, I'm bringing this situation to you that your will and your glory are accomplished. That's the first reason why prayer may not work. The second reason why prayer may not work is in Psalm 66, the psalm I read a couple of verses from right at the beginning, but let me read now verse 18 as well as verse 19. David is speaking, he says, If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God has surely listened and heard my voice in prayer. If I cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened, says David. If the first barrier to effective praying is my attitude to self may be wrong, the second barrier is my attitude to sin may be wrong. Now, of course, this doesn't mean if I have sin in my heart, because sinlessness is not an option available to us. I wish it was. But as we're told in the New Testament, if anybody claims to be without sin, he deceives himself. Part of the package of salvation is not sinlessness in this life. So we live with the fact that we fail, and we do fail. But he talks about cherishing sin in my heart. That is holding on to sin, not dealing with it, not confessing it. When I'm conscious of it, allowing myself the liberty of retaining this favorite sin of mine that I like to hold on to and not declare war on as we need to. 
And if I cherish sin in my heart, says David, the Lord won't listen. And by the way, when David wrote this psalm, he knew what he was talking about. We haven't time to look at this, but read Psalm 51 sometime, which is a psalm that David prayed after his adultery with Bathsheba and having committed adultery with her and discovering she was pregnant. He tried to get rid of her husband, whose name was Uriah. Uriah was a conscientious man and he had Uriah sent to the front line of a battle and he said to his commander Joab, when the battle's fierce, put Uriah in the severest part of the battle. Eventually got a message back saying, we've got some good news and bad news, David, from the front. The bad news is we were in a battle with the Philistines and they actually conquered us. But here's the good news, Uriah was killed in the fight. You're off the hook. Nobody will know that Bathsheba's baby is yours and not his. When David wrote Psalm 51, which was his psalm of confession, he talked there about his transgressions are ever before him and the barriers that are built up between him and God. And he cries out, create a pure heart in me. Renew a right spirit in me. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. And David came back in brokenness and contrition, but he knew if I cherish sin in my heart, the gates of heaven seem closed to me when I pray. One of my favorite characters in the Bible one of my favorite prophets, should I say, is Jeremiah. In fact, he is my favorite prophet. Jeremiah had one of the toughest jobs in the whole of the Old Testament, and that was he was to preach for 40 years, and in those 40 years to never see a single convert. I can find three people in the book of Jeremiah who were sympathetic to him. His secretary called Barak, but Jeremiah was never convinced of Barak. He wrote a whole chapter for Barak in chapter 45 saying, do you think great things for yourself, Barak? Think them not. So he was always uh, unsure of Barak. And a man called ebed Melech, who was an Egyptian, who rescued him from a pit when he'd been thrown into it. And a man called Ahikam, who also hid Jeremiah and supported him when people wanted to kill him. So the only three people who showed any sympathy towards Jeremiah. Otherwise, for 40 years, he preached faithfully, never saw any response. But the interesting thing about Jeremiah's experience is that when he began his ministry, God forbade him to ever organize prayer meetings. Because if you do, said God, you'll be wasting your time. I'll never listen to you. Let me read you some verses. Jeremiah 7, verse 16. Do not pray for this people nor offer any plea or petition for them. Do not plead with me, I'll not listen to you. Chapter 11, verse 14, do not pray for this people or offer any plea or petition for them because I will not listen when they call on me in that time of distress. In chapter 14, 11, the Lord said to me, do not pray for the well-being of this people. I mean, this is incredible, isn't it? Here's Jeremiah being commissioned by God to go and preach and God told him what to preach, but Jeremiah, don't pray for the people that you're going to preach to because I won't listen to you if you do. And then he said in chapter 15 and verse 1, the Lord said to me, even if Moses and Samuel were to stand before me, my heart would not go out to these people. Now Moses and Samuel were two of the aristocracy of the Old Testament. And God says to Jeremiah, even if they were to pray on your behalf, Jeremiah, I'm sorry, I won't listen. Now I imagine it was a little difficult for Jeremiah to get enthusiastic, don't you? I mean, if I came here just for tonight and God somehow said to me, don't pray for these folks tonight. They are so hardened. They are so stubborn. There's going to be no work of God in their lives tonight, but preach anyway. I'd find that a little difficult to get enthusiastic, don't you think? But this is for 40 years, the entire ministry that Jeremiah had. Why did God prohibit him to pray for the people? Well, in chapter 11, which is one of the chapters where he told him not to pray, he says in verse 17, Jeremiah eleven seventeen. the Lord Almighty who planted you has decreed disaster for you because of the house of Israel and the house of Judah. They have done evil and provoked me to anger by burning incense to Baal. In other words, he's saying there, my problem with the Israelites is they are refusing to deal with sin. And they've provoked me to anger. 
Actually, when Jeremiah began his ministry, there was a, a superficial revival taking place in Judah. I say revival. Everybody was going to the temple in a way they hadn't done before, but it was superficial. You see, when Jeremiah began his ministry, the king was a man called Josiah. Josiah came to the throne two years after his grandfather Manasseh died. Manasseh was one of the most evil kings that ever reigned in Judah. I mentioned him a few weeks ago. He undid all the good his father, whose name was Hezekiah, had done. He installed pagan gods in the temple in Jerusalem. He'd sacrificed his own sons to the pagan gods, slitting their throats over the altar in the temple of God. This was Manasseh. He was heavily into the occult, practicing witchcraft, sorcery, divination, and he consulted mediums and spiritists and left an appalling legacy of vice, corruption, and idolatry. His son Amnon came to the throne. He was assassinated in two years, and then Josiah came to the throne. And he was eight years old when he came to the throne, but when he was 16, he was converted. It says he began to seek after the Lord his God, or his father's God, or the God of Israel. And then four years later, at the age of 20, he began to clean up Jerusalem. At the age of 26, he began to clean up the nation, including the temple, which had been so uh, abused and derelict after his grandfather. And while they were cleaning up the temple, one of the priests some, in some back room came across a dusty old scroll, pulled it out, blew off the dust, opened it up, and said, so I've never seen this before. They took it to King Josiah, and they realized it was instructions God had given to them. We recognize it and identify it as being a large section of the book of Deuteronomy that he found in the temple. Took it back, blew off the dust, began to read it, and Josiah was so grief-stricken by the fact they'd not been obeying what God had told them to do that he ordered and organized a huge celebration of the Passover. You can read this in Second Chronicles 34 and 35, they provided altogether over 41,000 sheep and goats and cattle for the sacrifices. There had never been a celebration like this since the days of Samuel, it tells us. And the whole nation joined in. There was a carnival atmosphere. Everybody was enthusiastic. They were all at the temple joining in this celebration. Everybody was enthusiastic, that is, except one man, and his name was Jeremiah. And Jeremiah went up to the temple, and you can read Jeremiah chapter 7 sometime. It's his famous temple sermon where he stood outside the temple and he began to preach about the fact that although it has become fashionable for you to worship God and be in the temple, you are not dealing with your sin. This revival is superficial. This revival is just the following of a popular king. It's a cultural thing. It's not a spiritual thing. And he says, unless you come in genuine repentance, you will never do business with God. And of course, they didn't like him for that, so they're angry with Jeremiah. He's the party pooper, spoiling it all for them. But you see, that's why God said, Jeremiah, don't pray for these people, because if I regard iniquity, if I cherish iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me, as David wrote there in Psalm 66. And for 40 years, because they never dealt with their sin, they never took seriously their need to be right with God. For 40 years, Jeremiah, don't pray yet, don't pray, don't pray, still don't pray, 39th year, don't even pray now, 40th year, can I have a prayer meeting on the last day of my life? No, because I won't even answer you because they're so stubborn. And by that time, of course, they've been taken away into Babylon, into exile. But you see, if you and I are going to pray, then we have got to make sure that we're not just coming to get from God what we would like him to give to us, but we are dealing with those barriers to God's working in our lives and circumstances. We're living in a spirit of repentance. If I cherished sin in my heart, says David, the Lord would not have listened, but God has listened. And heard my voice in prayer, he says. 
Let me ask you, is there some hidden, maybe some secret sin in your life that you're not dealing with? It will hinder your prayer life. I'm not saying is there, are there no areas of weakness, no besetting sins in your life, because we do have those. And your weaknesses and my weaknesses are different, but there are things I confess to God again and again, and I know we grow, we trust we grow, but I fail again, and that happens. I'm not talking about that, because when your attitude towards God is one of repentance, when you do fall, you immediately come back and say, Lord, I'm sorry, and he cleanses you. But it's cherishing sin. It's saying, I have this little pet sin that I enjoy, and I love it, and I'm holding it. It'll control everything else. When we lived in England, we lived in the middle of a field. I mean, we had a house in the middle of a field. <laughs> I don't mean we... <laughs> and there was a private driveway, which was on the grounds of Cape and Ray Bible School, where I was working, but there was a driveway, private driveway that ran half a mile or so. And right from the time my kids were small, they would often sit on my knee when I drove the car down to our house, and they would hold the wheel, and they would imagine they were driving. And uh, as far as they were concerned, they were steering the car, but what they did not know was that I always had my little finger tucked around the bottom of the wheel. My arm would be around them, my little finger on the bottom of the wheel. And so as we aimed for sheep, we had sheep in our fields, <laughs> I would make sure that I turned the wheel enough and uh, the children never seemed to ever realize that I was doing that. As far as they were concerned, they had 95% of the wheel. They thought they had 100% of the wheel. I had just 5%, one little bit of the wheel. But my one finger on that wheel controlled the car. And you know, you can keep one finger on your own favorite sin that you refuse to deal with and f refuse to bring to the cross of Christ and say, well, generally I'm willing to deal with everything else, but this one thing is mine. And you'll find it'll control everything else. And your prayers will bounce off the ceiling. David tells us, actually the sin is wrong. The third barrier to effective praying is in 1st John chapter 3 and verse 21 and 22. Let me read this, 1st John chapter 3, verse 21. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and we receive from him anything we ask. What a marvelous statement. Receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. First half of this verse is wonderful. We have confidence in coming to God. We receive from God what we ask. Why? Because we obey his commands. We do what pleases him. The third reason praying may not be effective is our attitude to submission might be wrong. But because I live in submission, says John, and I do what pleases him, I obey his commands, then in that context I come with confidence to God. And you see, submission to the Lordship of Christ in every area of our lives is not an optional ingredient, it is fundamental and indispensable if the rest of the Christian life is going to function, and in particular here, if our prayer life is going to function. We cannot just bring God in when it's convenient, live our own lives the rest of the time, bring him in again when we need him again, but live with disregard to his rule in our lives. There's once a fisherman out with some friends in a storm. This fisherman had been a Christian, but he was out of fellowship with God. And his friends knew he'd been a Christian, and in this storm they said to him, you pray. This storm is threatening to swamp our ship. You're a Christian, pray. He said, well, it's a long time since I've ever done that. 
It's a long time since I've really entered the church. And they said, but there's no, nobody else here who's ever claimed anything like you have to be a Christian, so you pray. And he prayed, and apparently he said, Oh Lord, I haven't asked anything of you for the last 15 years. And if you help us now and bring us safely back to land, I promise you I won't bother you again for the next 15 years. <laughs> well, you see, prayer like that doesn't work. I think one of the saddest words in the Bible are the words of King Saul at the end of his life when in 1 Samuel chapter 28 and verse 15 he says this 1 Samuel 28 and verse 15 he says I'm in great distress the Philistines are fighting against me and God has turned away from me he no longer answers me either by prophets or by dreams and actually Adding to the sadness and the tragedy of those words, he's addressing them to a spirit in a seance. And he's called up the spirit of Samuel. And he says, I'm in great distress. But here's the tragic bit. God has turned away from me. He no longer answers me. I can no longer get through to God. That's why I've come to this medium and asked her to call up this spirit. You see, it's tragic because if you know the story of Saul, he was the first king of Israel. And when he's introduced on the pages of Scripture in 1 Samuel 9, he's impressive. He, we're told he's without equal. He's a head and shoulders above everybody else. And God told Samuel, this is the man I'm going to appoint as king. God anointed him. Samuel recognized him, anointed him with oil, brought him before the people. The people recognized him, said, long live the king. It tells us that God changed Saul's heart. It tells us the spirit of God came on him in power. You know the story of Saul. The first years of Saul's life were wonderful. But then things went wrong. God told him, I have an agenda for you as king of my nation. And part of that agenda was, I want you to destroy the Amalekites. They were a group of people who always a thorn in Saul's flesh. Destroy them all. And Saul went and battled with them. But he kept alive the king and he kept alive some of the best of their cattle and the best of their sheep. God had said, destroy everything that belongs to them. And when Samuel came to Saul and said, he said, Saul, God has given me a word for you. Why have you disobeyed me? I haven't disobeyed you, said Samuel. I killed them all pretty well, generally speaking. I kept alive Anak, their king. He could be good for intelligence purposes. He can tell us where other pockets of Amalekites are, because there were other pockets around. And God said, Saul, because you've followed your own agenda, you've not submitted yourself to my agenda. I'm looking for a man after my own heart. And of course, you know, he found David, but David was only a boy then. He waited years for Saul to die. Saul stood on the throne for 40 years, and it could well have been 20 of those years. He was totally out of touch with God. And here's a man who had known God. Here's a man who had experienced God. Here's a man on whom it says the Spirit of the Lord came in power. But now he's saying to a spirit... I'm in great distress. God has turned away from me. God no longer, ang no longer listens to me. Now, is this because God has said, okay, so I've got other interests these days. I'm away from you. No, of course not. God's ear is never closed to the person who comes on his terms. But as it says in chapter 28, when Saul spoke and said, God has turned away from me, he got the answer. It's because you did not obey the Lord Saul, your attitude of submission was wrong, and because your attitude of submission was wrong, God no longer listens to you. That's why we can't divide up the work of Christ. He's Savior and He's Lord, and these are separate things, and being Lord is kind of an optional extra. If Christ is not Lord, your prayer life will not work. Because as 
John writes, if our hearts not condemn us, we have confidence before God and we receive from anything we ask because we obey his commands and we do what pleases him. But if you don't obey him, you don't seek to do what pleases him, then we don't receive what we ask. Our praying is hindered. How's your attitude to self? How's your attitude to sin? How's your attitude to submission? These are three barriers to prayer if your attitude to them is wrong. And there's a final one. And this lesson only applies specifically to less than half the people here tonight, probably one third of the people here tonight. And I could point out who it applies to. I, I could point fingers to people who I know this applies to. And I could point people to people I know this doesn't apply to. Let me read it to you. It's in 1 Peter 3 and verse 7. I was nearly going to point out a few people then and say this doesn't apply to you. But I, I, I won't. Let me read the verse to you. First Peter 3 verse 7. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life. Do you know why? Listen, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Husbands, if you don't treat your wives well, your prayer life will be hindered. The fourth barrier is my attitude to my spouse might be wrong. Now, although he speaks specifically there in 1 Peter of husbands being considerate towards their wives, we can legitimately broaden this a little to our relationships generally. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 23 and 24, Jesus there in the Sermon on the Mount says, If you're offering your gift at the altar and you remember your brother has something against you, this is you're going to the altar to bring your gift, you're coming to worship God, you're coming to commune with God, but you remember your brother's got something against you, leave your gift in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Not, well, when you've offered your gift on your way home, make a detour and visit your brother. No, don't offer your gift until first you put it right with your brother. Now, when he says that your brother has something against you, it could be for one of two reasons. Either because he is wrong, he's got something against you, and he's wrong to have it against you. That could be one reason. Or it could be that you are wrong. He has something against you for good reason. It's deliberately ambiguous. It doesn't matter who's right, who's wrong. If there's something within your brother, leave your gift. First go and be reconciled. Then come and offer your gift. He doesn't speak specifically of prayer there, but he's speaking of meeting with God, communion with God. And that principle applies. Because our relationship with God is not only going to influence our relationships with others, but our relationships with others will determine the quality of our relationship with God. That's why in 1 John 4 verse 20, John says, If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. Don't believe him. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. You see, we can kid ourselves about our relationship with God because God is not visible. But the reality, says John in this verse, of our relationship with God will be seen in our relationships with others and with our brothers. You know, in times of revival, when there have been genuine Movements of the Spirit of God that have resulted in some kind of revival and at times in history, these have come and usually gone again, but there have been times when, we've, when history has recorded this. One of the features, almost always, is that people begin to put things right with each other. That's one of the signs of real revival. I jointly wrote... 18 months ago, the history of the Keswick Convention, which is an event that's taken place in Britain for the last 125 years 
celebrated the 125th anniversary in the year 2000, and from there it spread throughout the world. There have been many Keswick conventions, and the purpose of the Keswick convention was meeting for a week of teaching from the Word of God in order to get right with God. They described it as a spiritual clinic in the early days. It's not a Bible conference, it's a clinic where you come for diagnosis and remedy. So they described it. And uh, there have been a couple of times in this history when God has met with the people there in, in a very unusual way, and there's been marks of revival. And one year, when writing this story, we discovered back in about 1922, I think it was, or 23, there had been a revival in the eastern part of England, in East Anglia. And uh, one of the main leaders of that had come to speak at Keswick, and God had uniquely blessed his ministry there, and people began to get right with God, and they went down to the local post office. In those days, people didn't carry checkbooks, but you could buy um, postal orders. And the post office, on the first day of that convention, ran out of postal orders of people coming to get postal orders, monetary amounts, to send, to put right things that were wrong, things to pay for. And that week was one of the weeks that came closest to revival at Keswick in his 125 years of history. People putting things right with each other. W.P. Nicholson, a famous Irish preacher in Northern Ireland, earlier in the 20th century, first half of the 20th century, there was a great movement of God under his ministry, and there's a big shipping company there called Holland and Wolf, and apparently he preached there to the employees of that shipbuilding business. And God worked in such a way that Harlan and Wolf had to build a whole new barn just to receive stolen property returned by the workers when God had touched their hearts. They began to put things right. But this ought not just to be a feature of revival, this ought to be something that we conscientiously are concerned to do, that when things are wrong that we put them right. And in very particular husbands in your marriage, Be considerate as you live with your wives, so that nothing will hinder your prayer. If your brother, somebody with whom you have a relationship, I think that's what's implied by saying your brother has something against you, and you're going to offer your gift, and you're going to worship God first, be reconciled, then come. And the avenue through to the heart of God will be open to you. But otherwise, the barriers will be there. Four barriers to effective praying. Our attitude to self might be wrong. We need to come and deal with that. Our attitude to sin might be wrong. We need to come to God and say, God, in this area of my sin, my favorite sin, my, the sin of which I'm most tolerant in my life, I want to bring it to the cross and be cleansed and forgiven. In my attitude to submission, we live under his lordship. Now, you to our spouse, out you to other people. We keep our relationships right, and we keep our relationship with God right as a result. I'm not greatly into introspection, but every once in a while, it probably wouldn't be a bad thing to just be alone somewhere and ask those four questions. What is my attitude to self, to sin, to submission? my spouse and to other people. Allow the Holy Spirit to bring cleansing into all those areas and then as the verse we read at the beginning said, God has surely listened and has heard my voice in prayer. Interestingly, the Lord's Prayer addresses all of this. We looked at the Lord's Prayer last time. As far as my attitude to self is concerned, the Lord's Prayer is entirely in the first person, plural, not singular. Our Father, who art in heaven, give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts. Lead us not into temptation. It's not give me today my daily bread. It's us. It's our. It's plural. It's dealing with self. Of course we come with our needs to God, but we're concerned about others, not just ourselves. Our attitude to self is dealt with in the Lord's Prayer. Our attitude to sin is dealt with in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debts. 
is one clause of the prayer, forgive us our sins, our transgressions, depending which translation you use. And another clause in the Lord's Prayer is, and lead us not into temptation, and deliver me from the evil one. Deliver us from the evil one. Deals with sin. Then our attitude of submission is included in the Lord's Prayer, because we are to pray, your kingdom come, that is your kingship be established, your will be done. Whatever I'm praying for, the Lord's Prayer says to us in those opening verses, we're submitting it to the will of God and to the contributing to the kingdom of God. And our attitude to our spouses, our relationships with other people is included. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who trespass against us. In the Lord's Prayer, he deals with those who trespass against us, those relationships that we have that become difficult, and we're bringing them to God in prayer. And it's interesting that these four barriers, there may be others, I can find these four barriers to prayer, specifically stated these are barriers to prayer. I find it interesting that they're all addressed in the Lord's Prayer. And that's why that model prayer we looked at last time which we can dangerously just recite parrot fashion without much meaning, or we can take its teaching seriously that we're coming to Christ and to God and saying it's about us, not me. It's about your will, not mine. It's about cleansing me of my sin, not tolerating my sin. It's about forgiving others, not criticizing and condemning others. Well, I have to ask myself the question as I do. I said to you on the first night, talking about prayer is a little bit difficult for me because it's not my strongest point by any means. And I struggle with time to pray. I've learned, as I'm sure many of us have, to adopt that pray without ceasing attitude. You're bringing God in all the time to everything, but the time to specifically pray. Walking is a good time to do that for me. When you're away from others and you just, your mind is free and you can just talk. But if we can access God, if we can engage in communion with God, if our praying can make a difference in our world as we talked about on another week, we better make sure these barriers are down. We better make sure our praying is not hitting the ceiling and we're meaning business and we're paying the price. And as that Psalm 66 says, God surely has heard my voice in prayer and all the marvelous consequences of that, that we bring God in to our situations and bring God in to our lives and bring God in to other people. Let's pray together. And let's just have a moment of silence and maybe, I don't know how God may have spoken to you tonight personally, that's his prerogative to put his finger on things if that is necessary in your life. And maybe again tonight we've looked into the word of God, you've looked into a mirror and you've seen a mirror which reflects this is why my praying seems so redundant, why God seems so distant. But tonight you're saying, Lord, I want to deal with those issues, I want to deal with that issue. I'm going to lead you in a prayer and I'm going to ask you if you're going to pray this prayer with me to stand in a moment, I'm going to pray for those who stand. Your standing is saying, God has spoken to me specifically about something that is a barrier to my praying and I want to bring it to him in repentance and deal with it. I'm going to ask you by standing to be indicating that and I'm going to pray for those who will be standing. But let's first pray a prayer of confession and acknowledgement of our need before God. Just pray in your own heart these kinds of words. Just pray with me. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much tonight that you're not distant, that you hear and you're willing to listen to our voices. You listen to our hearts' cries. 
But Lord, I realize there have been things, there's something in my life which hinders my walk with you, my talking to you. Whether it's myself, selfishness, my sin, my lack of submission in some area of my life, or my broken relationships, especially in the home and the family. Lord, I confess this to you. I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to open in that area of blockage, open the access to heaven again. That I might speak with God and know that he has listened and heard my prayer. Thank you for cleansing me. Give me the courage to put right things that need putting right. In Jesus' name.